At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. What I'm going to do is tell you uh, a little bit about what I do, and I'm the, now the Associate Administrator for Science. That means I'm the head of science for all of NASA, and that's a really cool job because we do Earth science, we do planetary science, we do astrophysics, we study the sun, uh, pretty much everything in the universe. Uh, and so I have a lot of fun doing that. Our mission uh, at NASA is pretty simple. We innovate, we explore, we discover, and hopefully we inspire, and I hope we can inspire some of you today. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I, that was at a time when we had a lot of big snowstorms, and I used to go out in my jacket and pretend that I was on Mars, and that my snow jacket was my spacesuit, and I'd dig tunnels and have a lot of fun. Uh, it's very strange that a kid who lives in the Midwest of the United States would also dream of climbing mountains, and so these snow banks would become my glaciers. Uh, I went on to study physics and astronomy, and build experiments that I would launch on rockets. This is actually a, a rocket that I launched uh, to study the sun, uh, an experiment with the Japanese called Hinotori when I was 20. And then I built my own experiments and launched them on high altitude balloons in graduate school. I got a PhD in physics. Uh, this is one of those balloon experiments where I would get it all sealed up and then I would send it up on a very big balloon, 40 million cubic feet, the size of this convention center, and it would sit for days uh, exploring cosmic rays and X-ray astronomy, black holes, neutron stars. But I really d wasn't satisfied just sending my experiments into space. I wanted to go. And so in 1992, I was selected as an astronaut. You're going to hear from another astronaut, a colleague of mine, Tom Jones. Uh, we're somewhat rare as astronauts because we're scientist astronauts versus pilot astronauts or engineer astronauts. Um, but I was able to go into space, as you heard, five times three times to the Hubble Space Telescope. And I don't know if you can see uh, all that clearly, but on this image, I have a big grin. Uh, you can see the image of the Earth reflected in my visor. This is my spacesuit. I'm out doing a spacewalk. But that big grin I've had almost all the time I've been in space. The most recent mission was in 2009, and this is the crew that I went up with. Uh, Scott Altman, an aeronautical engineer, was the commander of the mission. Greg Johnson, another aeronautical engineer, was our pilot. Uh, we had Megan MacArthur, an oceanographer, as our flight engineer and robotic arm operator. I'll show a picture of her in just a minute. Drew Foistel was geologist. As I said, I'm an astrophysicist. Mike Massimino, a mechanical engineer. And Mike Good, another aeronautical engineer. So this was our crew to go and upgrade and repair the Hubble Space Telescope. How many of you have seen pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope? Okay, good. Well, by the end of the talk, everybody can raise their hand, of course, because I'll show some more pictures. So here we are in Florida. We actually had two space shuttles ready, one that we were going to launch on Atlantis, endeavor in case something bad happened to come up and rescue us. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, it's pretty cramped getting into the space shuttle. We have our spacesuits, we have parachutes, and the space shuttle is pointing up so the chairs are on their backs. And we sit on our backs for a couple of hours while everybody else tries to get as far away as possible. It's a great day to go fly. On behalf of the KSC Processing and Launch Team, I'd like to wish you, your crew, and the whole Hubble Space Telescope team a, a great mission. Good luck, Godspeed, and we'll see you back here in about 11 days. So here we are sitting on planet Earth with about six seconds to go. The main engines light up. We check them out to make sure they're running properly. And then those two white boosters on the side, solid rocket motors light. And then you know you're going somewhere. Uh, that's a bad noise, by the way. I'll explain that later. Um, but we did lift off just fine, and we were heading up towards the Hubble Space Telescope. It's an incredibly rough ride. Uh, it's hard to describe, but it's really a very violent event. We ride on those solid rocket motors in the main engines for about two minutes, and then the solid rocket motors come off, and we're lucky to have cameras on those so you can see them. Uh, at, they'll come all the way down and land in the ocean. In fact, there's even a microphone, and you can hear the splash. And as we're going to, these cameras are recording, you can see that we're continuing on to space on the liquid propellants, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Eventually, eight and a half minutes later, we're doing 17,500 miles an hour. We dump the tank. We're in Earth orbit. We open the payload bay doors of the shuttle, and inside is all the equipment that we're going to use to 
with new scientific instruments, cameras for the Hubble Space Telescope. Now first we have to catch the Hubble Space Telescope and we do that by flying up underneath the telescope. This is a picture of Scott Altman, our commander, actually hand flying the space shuttle, weighs about 250,000 pounds, up underneath the Hubble Space Telescope until the Hubble is in the payload just floating over the shuttle. Now both of us are flying at 17,500 miles an hour. The Hubble Space Telescope and the space shuttle. The Hubble is about the size of a big yellow school bus plus the solar arrays, so it's pretty big. Now Meg, this is Megan MacArthur's first flight and she has to take the robot arm of the shuttle and drive it over and grab the Hubble with a little grappler. She's never flown the arm before. All we have in Houston are computer games that make her think on a screen that she's flying the robot arm. So this is the first time she's actually flown the arm. The Hubble Space Telescope is worth something like eight billion dollars, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> do you think her first space flight, first time in orbit, first time flying the arm, do you think she was under any pressure? <laughs> but she was successful. We were able to start getting dressed for EVA the next day. This is my spacewalking partner, Drew Feustel. I did three spacewalks on this mission with Drew. Uh, we have a lot of equipment, spare parts, spare spacesuit parts, food in case we got stranded in space, tools to fix the space shuttle, and everything we do we use a checklist, and this is Mike Massimino, the mechanical engineer. Uh, some of you may know him by his Twitter name, Astro Mike, but he's helping Drew and myself get dressed, and you want to make sure you get everything right, and that's why we use that instruction book, the checklist, so we don't forget something. You know, it'd be bad if you forgot to lock your helmet, you know, and you go outside and it pops off. And, um, but we got all dressed up for going to space. We're in the airlock, ready to go, uh, except for one small detail. I'm in my spacesuit, all sealed up, so if I go to a vacuum, I can breathe. I have oxygen uh, and all the equipment I need. Drew is in his spacesuit. Our commander, Scott Altman, is not. Uh, if you turn that handle, that lets all the air out. That'd be really bad because we'd be okay in our spacesuits, but Scott Altman wouldn't do so well. And we need him to land the space shuttle at the end of the mission. So we kicked him out. Uh, we turned the handle. The hatch opened. Uh, if you want to hear a story, you can ask the next speaker, Tom Jones, about what happens if you don't open the hatch when you tur turn the handle, um, if, if you run out of other questions. Uh, I got to go outside. I've already talked about this. This is the spacesuit, much like when I was nine years old wearing the big jacket. I've got this big spacesuit to keep me warm, also to keep me cold, because uh, the human body generates about 100 watts of heat, and you have to get rid of that heat, the electronics. In the backpack, I have oxygen. I have water. The water is used to circulate around a special suit to keep me cool. There's television cameras, radios. It's really a whole spaceship. And of course, I'm breathing, so I breathe in oxygen, which is in the backpack. I breathe out CO2, so there's actually a chemical system, lithium hydroxide, to absorb that CO2 so it doesn't build up so I can continue to breathe. Uh, everything we need. And those cameras are really neat, and I'll show you some video from the cameras later. As I said, we do everything with a checklist. Most of the checklist is actually what to do when things go wrong. And so this is a picture of me on the side of the telescope, Drew's on the side of the telescope, and we're trying to get the old super duper camera out of Hubble because we brought up a new one, a new digital camera, and it's stuck, and we can't get the bolt loose. So believe it or not, there's a step in the checklist that says what to do if the bolt won't come loose. And the first step is try harder. Uh, <laughs> And then it says try even harder, and then it says if you break the bolt, then it's a really bad day and you don't get the camera out. But fortunately, we did get the bolt out. Uh, and we also have not only the crew inside working the checklist and with all of their mental resources, uh, their ideas, there's hundreds of people on the ground who are helping us. Very much a team effort. So we were able to get that camera out. We put new batteries in, new gyros. Here's an image from the camera on the helmet looking into, this is Drew's camera, opening up the Hubble. The Hubble Space Telescope was designed with doors and bolts and latches to be serviced. We've done five servicing missions, each time upgrading the capabilities of the telescope. Now, this is one of those cameras. You know, it's not a little digital camera. These are big cameras, uh, very complex, a lot of capability. Well, we were successful on all of our spacewalking tasks. Uh, this is one of those cameras that I said is really big. I convinced Drew Feustel and the rest of my spacewalkers uh, that they had to work out in the gym every single day to be strong enough to lift these 800-pound cameras. But of course, in space, everything's floating. Everything's in free fall. 
But you do have to be strong because working in the spacesuit, and Tom Jones can tell you too, is really hard. You're like the Michelin man. You're in an inflated spacesuit, and just moving your arms, you're doing work. How many of you are in AP physics? Anybody? How many of you have taken physics? Okay, good. So you know that physics has a term that's called work. It's force times distance. So every time you move your arm, you're doing work against the pressure of the suit. So it's very exhausting. So one of the things about space flight is it's really important to be in good shape, to work out, to have, when you lift weights, you get strong bones and strong muscles. Also very important here on Earth. Uh, so it was very useful in space to have spent all that time in the gym. After finishing all of our repairs, we, Megan grabbed Hubble again, put it on the end of the arm, put it out to space, and in fact, today is Hubble's birthday. 24 years ago, it was launched into space. How many of you are younger than 24? <laughs> Most of you. So you've only known a world with the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope is the most amazing scientific machine ever created by humans. It's discovered storms on Mars, uh, asteroid impacts on Jupiter, black holes in the center of every galaxy, verified that black holes really existed, measured the age of the universe, 13.72 billion years old, measured the expansion rate, I'll talk more about that. Um, but they're practical things in space. Here uh, is a typical lunch in space. I like to hang upside down, although I thought I was right side up and everybody else was upside down. Uh, here's Drew making a chicken sandwich. Uh, he just floats the tortilla in front of him. We use tortillas because they don't make crumbs like bread, otherwise you'd have a snowstorm every time you make a sandwich. I encourage all of you to try this at home tonight. Just put a tortilla up, put a bunch of stuff on it, let go of it, see if it floats. <laughs> I think we know what will happen. One of the things my son asked me to do is to float a ball of water in space and take a picture of it for him. So I was floating the ball and then I said, wow, it's a good lens. You know, it's a convex lens. And so Drew's nose really isn't that big. And so you can see Drew's image and if those of you who know convex lenses know it flips the image. Uh, so you can see Drew's pictures upside down. The other thing convex lenses do is they magnify. If you, so I said, hey Drew, get really, really close. <laughs> so we're, it's still floating in front of him, so this is inside of his eyeball, that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of fun things you can do in space. One of the fun things you can do in space is, is feed the fish. Those are uh, peanut M&Ms and uh, it's fun to play with food. That is actually tang. We do fly tang in space. Uh, and another way of drinking it, usually they're in drink bags, that's a ball of water. Uh, now it's a drink. Now we also did some serious physics experiments. This is all after we deployed the Hubble. This is the stability of rotation of solid bodies around various axes, another classic physics experiment. <laughs> Conservation of angular momentum. Now while we were doing these serious physics experiments downstairs in the space shuttle, we have two floors, the crew on board upstairs, the flight crew, what were they doing? Playing video games. <laughs> this is the land of the space shuttle training video game, which I encourage Scott to play over and over and over again. I wanted it to be as good at landing as possible, and I was filming this sequence. So I kept saying, no, I didn't get it this time, do it again. So finally, after two days of bad weather in Florida, they said, hey, why don't you go to California instead? We got everybody dressed back into their spacesuits, uh, got all situated in our seats. Scott Altman put his glasses on, put on some California music. Megan said, just get to work, which we did. We did our deorbit burn about 7,000 miles away from California fell into the atmosphere, used the atmosphere as a break, which made the atmosphere really hot, a plasma outside of our space shuttle, 3,000 degrees. Um, hundreds of miles from California, we picked up the landing site. It was a beautiful, clear day. Coming over uh, Edwards Air Force Base, runway 22, we came in for a landing. Here we are, about seven times steeper than a commercial airliner, but we're a glider uh, going through about 11,000 feet at about 300 miles an hour. Scott Altman did a great job lining us up. About 300 feet above the ground, you deploy the landing gear. It has to come down or everybody dies, so it's good that it does. There's all kinds of risks here. Uh, but Scott did a great job of, after 7,000 miles of a glider, putting us on a runway a couple hundred feet wide and 15,000 feet long. We deploy a parachute so that the nose gear doesn't hit as hard, uh, and then we slowed down after traveling around the Earth about 197 times, five million miles, five spacewalks, grabbing the Hubble, deploying the Hubble, uh, really just a wonderful, wonderful trip, uh, and that's why the Hubble was able to celebrate its birthday today. Now, you know, the big question is, did it work? 
And so here's an image with one of the new cameras. This is a combination of an infrared and optical image of a spiral galaxy like ours. There's about 100 billion stars here. There's probably about 50 billion rocky planets. And uh, it's just fantastic what Hubble's able to do. So what we do at NASA Science is investigate the world and the universe to answer some fundamental questions. What causes weather, earthquakes, climate change, the sun to vary? How does the sun affect the earth? How did the universe form? Where did we come from? Are we alone? And is there an Earth 2.0? Now, if you want to be part of NASA, you don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to wear a white lab coat like my kids here in a microbiology laboratory. You could drive a rover on Mars. You could explore the depths of the universe, win a Nobel Prize. You could study the Earth and solve global warming in a laboratory in Antarctica. My advice to you is study hard, play hard, and have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you.